Please welcome to the stage, Kevin Kelly. It's great, wonderful to be here. So fantastic to be speaking to people who are so much younger than me. <laughs> really. I feel like, I think I'm the oldest person here. And uh, it's really fantastic to have the opportunity. Thank you, Andes, for inviting me to talk about Actually, the directive I got was to be a little different, to, to do something different, so I'm going to talk a little bit about my own life and um, my own journey as an independent producer and creator. And um, that's sort of my logo up there. But what I, you know, if, if, if you hear anybody talk about giving a presentation, the one thing they tell you that you should always do is that you always tell no more than three things, that people don't remember beyond the first three things. And uh, that's really true. It's absolutely true. If you tell more than three things, you don't remember it. And so um, I'm going to tell you the 30 things. <laughs> and you're not going to remember any of them. And, uh, but while I'm talking about what I'll try to take you to a place you haven't been to and tell you some, show you some things you haven't seen, and of course you'll forget them all uh, in, at the, by the end. And uh, you'll have been on a great journey, but in, in the meantime, you'll have gone somewhere. And so, um, when, I was, when I was young, um, I found this book in the library, and it was uh, called The Golden Book of Chemistry. And it told how you could do real chemistry experiments. And I set up a chemical laboratory in my basement with all that kind of equipment that you see up there. And uh, it told you how to make chlorine. So you can make chlorine gas from bleach and toilet cleaner. And you can make clouds of it, and that's actually uh, up there. And that's what you know. That's what I did. I, I was the, had the only chemistry lab in America where I didn't make a bomb as a kid, <laughs> but I made chlorine glass gas. And uh, I found another book in the library called How to Make a Home Nature Museum, and I made a nature museum in my basement. Um, I had kids in the local neighborhood contributing to it, and I made all these kinds of really cool stuff, taken from the instructions about how to. Um, mount insects, how to preserve reptiles. One of the coolest ones was this thing about you take a caterpillar, you roll out the guts with a pencil, and then you take hot gas in its butthole and inflate it. <laughs> I mean, how could you not like that as a 12-year-old kid, right? Really. Uh, but also, they have these instructions. This is for preserving, uh, doing taxidermy of, of of a bird, but if you notice in the upper right, uh, <laughs> above the right hand, arsenic. Of course every kid who's 12 years old have access to arsenic. <laughs> so I couldn't really figure out if this was a, kid, a book for kids or a book for adults. But um, I, I made a lot of stuff. And I, uh, when I was in middle school, uh, I made this thing in my room, which is a crude ripoff of the Dali, uh, Dali uh, Salvador Dali painting, but unlike his painting, one of my clocks worked. There was actually a working clock which is in the room and I heard that uh, my brother, one of my brothers went back and 30, 40 years later, 45 years later, the they're still there, they've left it. In, they haven't repainted it. So that was pretty cool. And, but I, I couldn't decide whether to um, be an art student or go to MIT in college and so I skipped college basically. I dropped out and I backpacked around the world and. I just noticed the other day that there was a little prototype of my logo there that I painted on the back of my backpack uh, in 1971, 72. And um, I started traveling and I did the Appalachian Trail with two of my brothers, one of them who is visiting right here in the audience. Um, but mostly I went, I took the assignment to go to Asia and to start to photograph the unknown and the remarkable culture of Asia. Um, and that's me. Um, that's, I'm not in the Pacific Northwest. I'm actually in the Kashmir Valley wearing a non-ironic plaid shirt. <laughs> uh, and uh, I have to say that of 
when you're traveling, you want to have lots of one thing or the other, and it's much better to have lots of time than money. And I'll come back to that later. But um, my, I took it upon myself to basically to, to photograph the disappearing cultures of Asia. That was my self-assignment. And um, here I am in Taiwan at a, at a, um, a temple in a my kind of an early selfie in a certain sense, um, taking a picture through a traffic mirror. And um, I, I wanted to tell you, uh, show you a couple of the pictures that I took from that time because what you'll see from these is that um, rather than just going to visit a different continent, I was actually visiting uh, a different time. I was actually in a time machine and I was transported um, back to medieval times and in the 15th century. And there was traveling at that time was at a real liminal moment where if you had very little money and lots of time, you could actually go back into time into places like Srinagar, Kashmir, or Japan. And um, so I was collecting, and this is my job, I was photographing this to make a book, to make a, a book that would show this remarkable time that is basically was disappearing and in many ways has already disappeared from the world. And um, I was using uh, analog technology. I was photographing on slides, which, um, as you know, when you get a slide, it's, a kind of, it's like a raw file. There's no processing really possible on it. Um, and this journey and, this, and these photographs, um, I wanted to turn it into a book, but the, 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 te the technology didn't really exist. This was, um, as I said, I'm, I was using this kind of a camera and a point and shoot, and I was a nobody. And to produce a big photo book, you need to have, you need, it's, it's incredibly expensive to do the color correction, to do the processing, to do the typesetting, and you couldn't be, have a, do a photo book unless you were really famous, and I was a nobody. Um, but then, oops, the technology came along. I used Quark at the time, I used Photoshop, and I produced a book, a prototype book using inkjet printing about this big, and I just sent it off to Benedict Tashin at Tashin, and they decided to, he faxed back and said, yes, we're gonna publish it, because it was done. They didn't have to do anything. <laughs> it was like, why, couldn't, why wouldn't he do it? Because it already, I did everything. And I did that because technology allowed a new kind of success for, for publishers. It was, it was something that, that um, a, a nobody like me could produce and do it. All the work that they would have done in the old way would have, you know, probably 50 or you know, $200,000 or more just to do the pre-pressing and everything required for so many pictures because this book has 400 something images and by the way, no words. So um, I wanna talk a little bit more about this but I continued to make stuff. So I, start, I was raising bees and made beehives by hand. I made a house by hand which entailed cutting down the big trees, oak trees and turning them into those beams doing brickwork by hand, moving field stones. Um, I rode my bicycle across the US. I also started to work in a science lab making a micro documentary. It's a micro film of digestion. Um, I continued to make stuff in my own home. That's a mini museum. Um, I make, sometimes I'll make useful stuff like a bed, but mostly I make cool and useless stuff. Uh, you know, like a Lego wall, or this is um, a uh, robot made from five years of discarded uh, packaging material <laughs> with my son. And so I, 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 you know, I kept making more stuff and um, eventually uh, started the well, helped start the well, which was the first public access to the internet um, using computers like this. And I helped start. Um, Wired Magazine, and I edited that for the first generation. Um, and now I've been making more things like Cool Tools. And Cool Tools, as Andy mentioned, is a, um, it's, it's a it weighs five pounds. It's this, it's this huge thing. Making self-publishing on paper is, is a very different prospect because it actually have atoms to move around. But um, the key thing I want to, to bring your attention to is this idea of a catalog of possibilities. Um, 
This began as an extension of the first round of do-it-yourself movement in the 60s when there was hippies dropping out, going and remaking civilization in their own terms. And they would do things like build domes in the middle of the desert and have parties, which by the way, uh, <laughs> is a recurring theme these days. And um, at one of these domes, um, Stuart, started, Stuart Brand, who founded the whole Earth catalog, uh, started using some really cool analog technology to do self-publishing. And he made this book called The Whole Earth Catalog, Access to Tools. And the idea it was agnostic about what you did with the tools. He was just saying, here are tools that empower individuals to do stuff and make stuff happen. And uh, the technology that, that he discovered was two of these. One was called the IBM Selectric, which was a really cool thing. A lot of people haven't even, my son never saw a typewriter. Well, this is a cool typewriter because it's a typewriter that you can change fonts on. The types are on that ball. You just move the balls and you have new fonts. And it also did letter um, spacing and it could justify because it was kind of quasi digital analog. The other one was a Polaroid and you could take a Polaroid, a picture of something and it had a halftone screen you could add. It was kind of a hack. You could actually get um, something that you could print with. And so he made this um, Horth catalog and this self-publishing. And the other cool thing was besides the fact that you could make something that looked like it was typeset and, and uh, otherwise done professionally, it was done in one of these domes in the middle of the desert, the content was entirely user-generated. It was all written by the readers. There was no advertisers, so the readers fully supported it. And it was basically the same tone. If you read what's being written there, it's bloggers and the web, enthusiasts, amateurs expressing their passion. It was the web on newsprint. And so, um, I had basically, I worked at the Whole Earth Catalog and I took over when Stuart um, left to do other things. And so I took those same, that same gene and I made my own version of the Whole Earth Catalog updated for the century in color to produce the Whole Earth Catalogs which were about this size. Oops, oops, it would take about 30 people a, a year. With the new technology, I did, we did it with two people the same thing, because technology was allowing us to have a different kind of success. And I think that is the magic. We were using, of course, all the modern tools of, you know, uh, in design, but other tools like Elance. Uh, we had to proofread in, in 48 hours by, by distributing all around the world and having people proof it really fast. So those are the kinds of things that this, this technology allows. Again, for an individual to do something that would have normally have taken a whole staff, an institution, a nonprofit to do in the past. I wanted to do this for a very simple reason is my kids were going to college and I wanted to give them a crate of tools that they may not have been familiar with and I just couldn't fit all the tools in the crate that I wanted to. So I decided to do the catalog was a tool, all the other things that couldn't fit in that crate. And so my measure of success for that project was I wanted three copies of that book. If it made extra copies, then that was just gravy. And that's what some of the pages look like. There are lots of tools in the broadest sense of anything that's useful. Um, you know, goats, <laughs> right? How to raise goats. Um, and maps, how, you know, what if you wanted the world's largest map for your wall, where, where would you get one? Um, and the other kinds of things, just as an example, that the covers is the grip hoist, which is a super improved, superior version of a come along because instead of having a ratchet with, with set things, you, you can move multi-tons with human power with a precision of only millimeters. Um, and that's a better come along or the this microscope, which is a favorite. It's indestructible, non-electric. You can use it on, a, a, people use it on boats, kindergartens, anywhere. It's, it's a really good microscope that you almost can't destroy, and yet works really great. So those are the kinds of things that it covers, and this thing was self-published. I mostly catered to Amazon, so we got to number 15 on Amazon. I printed 42,000 copies. It was something that you could not have done without all these other technologies even 10 years ago, five years ago. But technologies give us new possibilities. And what the catalog is about is not about people buying more stuff. I'm not interested in, in people buying all these tools. I just want you to know that they exist. 
they're a possibility. And the possibilities that are available to us are far greater than we are aware of. While that was self-published, I also publish through New York. I, I, I do mainstream publishing. So I'm on both sides. And the point about technology is that we're going to have other kinds of publishing besides Main Street publishing and self-publishing. We'll have, we have unknown kinds of publishing, and that's what the technology is giving us. It's basically creating new ways to succeed. It's giving us new ways that we can actually optimize things. So as an example, everyone wants to have large audiences. I, to my knowledge, Facebook is the first company in the world to have a billion customers. That is only one kind of success, and that's actually a very hard kind of success to imitate. Um, in biology, there's all kinds of reproduction strategies. You have something like a sea urchin, which will produce millions and millions of offspring. That's success for them. And you have a chimpanzee, which will on average have five. That's success for them. You have things like a mayfly, whose success is measured in days. And you have bristlecone pine, whose success is measured in thousands of years. Those are different kinds of successes. And one is not better than the other. We think of evolution as a ladder, but it's really kind of a radial explosion. So every single species alive today is equally evolved and is equally successful. They're all successful. They're su the dandelion and the cockroach are as successful as the bird of paradise if they're surviving. So what I'm suggesting is that all these different three million species that we have cataloged on Earth already are all figuring out and all have their own definition of success. The, the, the success of one is going to look different than the success of the other. And so what we have right, right now is a Cambrian explosion of technology. And that is creating, at the very least, an explosion of different occupations and way that people can make a living in, and way that, that you can actually have success in a company. So the trade-off of that explosion is that the more possible ways that you can have success, the more likely your way will be unique. And the problem that people often have with success is they're often trying to imitate another one. And the whole point of that is that technology allows us to escape that and to more likely find a unique path. So we normally, you've heard from many people talk about their own careers and, and from the outside, it looks like oh, suddenly they were successful. They, went, they started something and then they went through, they did the right steps and then they were successful. But many people will tell you that the path looks more like sideways, backwards, two step forward, changing your mind, changing careers. And not only that, but somebody else's is going to be a different one. Those two will not be the same. And so that is, I think, the new stuff. In the old days, when you were a farmer, everybody was a farmer, success looked very similar. Now with technology, we have more choices and opportunities, and, oppor and those opportunities create different paths to success and different kinds of successes measured in different ways. So um, the more specific, though, the more there are trade-offs. The more specific your success is, the more that you're going to have to do trade-offs. And I want to just kind of conclude with covering some of those dilemmas, because there is no right answer. These are just things that as we navigate through this possibility space, we have to think about. We have to, we have to trade off. So the more specific, the more trade-offs. The one thing I want to talk about is, is um, like when we start something, we have a definition of a startup. Paul Graham and the whole VC world have a definition of a startup, which is it grows fast. That is just one kind of success. That's a success that the VCs really value. But that's not the only kind of success. I like to think about a lot of these things as pigeons because the, they, the whole idea they're into, like, we need billions of them. We need millions. It's this idea of a very large scale. But that is only one kind of bird. That's not a bird of paradise. A bird of paradise is not in the billions. It's very rare. But we value it. And sometimes we value it for certain purposes more than the pigeon. So, there's one thing about 
making a living, and there was another one about making a fortune. And those are, those are two very different things. And sometimes the making a living is denigrated as lifestyle business, as a lifestyle business. But it's, in fact, I think there's more opportunities and more variations and more possibilities that technology is going to let us to make a living rather than making a fortune. You can, can we make a living making apps? Can you make a living making an internet startup? Why do they all have to be of the super growth version of things? Well, they don't. And technology is gonna allow us to do things differently. I think the greatest failures are due to success. And I want to just very briefly reintroduce to the idea of the innovator's dilemma, which was created or written most by um, Clay Christensen and here it is in, very, in a very brief way, which is that Detroit was making this cars in, the, say, the, you know, the 1946, and that was the apex of technology at that time. And, it was, and the GMs and the automobile manufacturers were the apex of corporations. It's what everybody wanted to be. Back in Japan, right after the war, Honda was taking surplus generators from radios and putting them onto bicycles. Who is paying attention to that? Nobody, okay? Well then, um, you roll ahead a couple decades and you have the Cadillac, which is again, the apex of technology in the world. It's the most complex thing. It's, and the corporation itself from GM is, is what everybody wants to be. It's, 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 it's the apex of the organization. And Honda is making his first car, which is a toy. It looks like a golf cart. Okay, who's paying attention? Nobody. Well, the whole point of this is that the, is, is that the successes come from the outside rather than from the successful already because success in some ways binds your options. And so through relentless improvement, you had Honda um, winning because they eventually just developed a small gasoline engine, which is really what people eventually wanted. And so what that means is that when you're in the startup, when you're an individual, when you have very little resources, you are playing in the arena of the small motors or the dot matrix printer or software for hobbyists, you're, you're playing in an area where there's very low margins, it's high risk, there is a very small unproven market. And who wants, to, who wants to be there? Nobody wants to do business there. That's a terrible place to do business. 99% of startups fail. Why? Because they're in this domain where it's really, really tough. But that's where all the new innovations will come from. And so the reason why startups are there is because they have no choice. If they had a lot of money, they would try to buy the solutions, which is what the big companies try to do. And that doesn't ever get you anything. So I'm just saying that, that there's a, the, the innovator's dilemma is that if you're a big company or if you're an individual and you're successful, every single accountant will tell you that you should invest into excellence. You should take what you're doing and make it more excellent. That is the reasonable thing to do. But of course, if you do that, you're going to cut yourself off from all that future development. However, if you decide to become an innovator, you're gonna most likely fail. That is the dilemma. It, it, it's a waste, it's like doing science. It's a waste to do experiments that you know are gonna fail, but the dilemma is you have to balance that in some way. That's true for individuals and creators as well. That is the dilemma of the creators. You're kind of trying to balance this thing. There's no right answer. Everybody will have a different combination of these things. And this, another way to talk about this is as the trade-off between optimization and discovery. Should you optimize what you know how to do or should you waste your time in discovering new things that you don't know how to do? There's no answer, but that is the trade-off that we all will face. But there's also other trade-offs like that Knowledge versus imagination. Maybe this one describes it a little better. To be an artist, you kind of have to think about things that are implausible, impossible, unlikely. At the same time, you need to ship. And so you have to wend your way through that trade-off between things that seem impossible, that are unlikely, that are imaginative, versus the reality of doing something and completing it. There's a similar one between answers and questions. 
Are you a person who likes to have solutions or a person who likes to ask new questions? There's also, in, in this era, a trade-off between likes and loves. And let me explain that. Um, these two guys, two guys did this really fantastic program which was on um, the America's Most Wanted painting. So they asked people what they wanted in a painting and then painted what they wanted. Okay, and that's what people wanted. They, it's really liked. There's tons and tons of likes of this kind of painting. And this is not just in the US, they did it all around the world. And different countries, are, there's little variations like water buffaloes in the Chinese version. But it's what people liked. And Trey uh, Radcliffe is a friend of mine, a photographer. He does photographer, uh, photographers, uh, photographs that people like. Okay, they really like them. They get millions of likes, but they kind of look like that other image. And um, uh, they're not really maybe photographs that people love. So I went back to say, what are the hits 100 years ago? 1914, what were the hits? And I looked at them, and what's interesting is, is that you won't really recognize them. You, um, this is the uh, songs from 1914. None of them survived, really. What about uh, fiction? Well, you see uh, Winston Churchill. It's a different Winston Churchill, by the way. It's a, he, he, he produced serial uh, historical novels. Uh, the only one you might recognize is Pollyanna. All the rest are forgotten. Um, the same thing you could do with... Um, uh, films. There was a Wizard of Oz, which was actually the pre precursor to the, to the uh, famous one. It was done by the author of The Wizard of Oz, and it was, they're really terrible. So the point is, is that longevity is, is a different kind of measurement, uh, being loved versus being liked. These are all liked very much, there's nothing wrong with being liked, it's just that there's a different kind of success in, in longevity. I interpreted that as a different kind of success in this idea of the thousand true fans, which is neither the hit nor the tail, where if you, it was a mathematical suggestion that if you had a hundred, if you charge, if you had a thousand true fans who would buy anything you produce, do drive to see you sing, um, get the hard cover and the soft cover and the e-version, e if you had true fans like that and you had a thousand of them and they could get a hundred dollars a year, you could have something like a living. There are lots of platforms that do this now. The next step and technology, and this is where I'm going, is that technology is introducing the idea of like, well, we can have crowdsource equity. You heard a little bit about the Patreon, this idea that you could have patrons. Technology is allowing us to have different ways to succeed, and the kind of technology is coming along, like Bitcoin and the blockchain, AI on the cloud. I think the startups for the next 10,000 startups, the solution is going to be AI on the cloud plus X, this is going to change the way we define success. Of course, bots of all sorts, if you can imagine if you could have something helping you make things. What do you want to optimize? That's what we get to ask now. That's the first time that we have a chance to, to say, we can have new ways to optimize things, all right? Personally, what I'm trying to optimize in my life is opportunities to learn and time to make cool and useless stuff, okay? so so. Um, there are new ways to optimize, and you have different trade-offs on them, okay? New ways to succeed. And I think that the, you know, the way I want to end this is that uh, I've told you all kinds of stuff that uh, you're not going to remember, so. Uh, as I was saying, the three impo most important things <laughs> is to decide whether you want to maximize optimization, or to forget the rules, and maximize discovery. But most importantly, technology is going to allow you to define your own success. Thank you for your, for your time. <laughs>